and uh, we called it Territorial, which was an amateur soldier, so in 1937 I joined, and I was then 20, and uh, very proud of myself, thinking all the girls were looking at me in my uniform. Then, um, when things got serious, the Czech crisis, so was, Germany was going to attack Czechoslovakia, and as territorial soldiers, we were going to go and help. But fortunately, nothing happened. And the next thing was we were in Norway, in Narvik, because this time Germany was going to attack, uh, rather, the Russians were going to attack the Finns. And we didn't think it was very fair. Mighty Russian, poor little Finland. So, like a bunch of idiots, off we were going to help. And one of the funny things that I've never seen written or that Germany was going to help too. We all, almost in 38, were going to be with the Germans. Instead, in 39, against them. But Mitterrand, who was the general in charge of the Finns, sued for peace, fortunately, for us. So instead of getting involved in anything, peace was restored and we got back. <laughs> I just felt like being chased by the Germans. Everywhere we went, we were, the Germans were chasing us. And I found that uh, when I was commissioned that I used to get the same amount of money by joining the, the Royal Indian Navy, which was before partition. So being a mercenary, I said, why not get more money for doing the same job? So I became a commission in the Royal in the Indian Navy. It was before the Indian nation was partitioned, it was all one. So off I went east, stationed in Bombay, uh, nothing very spectacular, because we're in the Japanese theatre now. I'd left the German theatre. One of the funny things, I was in, right back again, I was in an old f uh, French fortress called the Citadel. I went to see it after the war, and it was actually built to keep the English out when England and France were always fighting, but that was probably 200 years ago. We were in this old citadel, and uh, it was like an old-fashioned fort. We were up on the perimeter of the thing, and uh, one of them, when we went in, there were French soldiers with their arms piled, and they were cooking potatoes. And they, when they saw us with our uh, bren guns, and, and they, they shoot us out, because they were ready to surrender. I mean, I shouldn't really remember those sort of things, but they didn't want us in there. They say the Bosch shoot us, the Bosch being the Germans. Ago. And we couldn't believe it. They were supposed to be fighting with us, but they didn't want us in there. So in the end we got in this old citadel on the wall, and all I can remember there, you know, the Germans, well, yes, we took the French flag down since they weren't fighting, and we put the Union Jack up. Um, black, I was remember a black car came in with four Germans in it. And I'm up on the wall with the captain, this guy who actually didn't display any great bravery in the end. But then they came up and they had the Nazi salute, and he was an uber lieutenant. And they would, so I can remember the exact words. He demands our surrender, and this captain stands for attention, and he said, uh, it's a British soldier's duty to fight, just as it's the German soldier's duty to fight. There'll be no surrender. Well, I'm shaking like a leaf while all this is going on. But uh, that was just after that, when they were very, very polite. I mean, they, they did that and he did this. That was just after that when the Stukas came down and the, the guns and the, and the wood area. Because we were up on the wall of the Citadel. It was, it was very polite the way it was done. Up this guy went. Black news, black cars. It was uh, almost unbelievable how polite, in a way, the thing was done. But, uh, like I remember the exact words, British soldiers duty to fight, it's just the German soldiers duty to fight. No surrender. And then all the hell's smugglers. <laughs> and this was in Calais, France. The reason we were there, they were trying to get that big number of troops out of Dunkirk. 
so it, um, it all seemed rather ludicrous, but there was a huge, about a quarter of a million British troops, they were trying to get them back to England because the situation was a calamity at that time in, in Europe, and our job in Cali was to keep the German army from coming from the west in this side, if you sort of follow. And it, uh, we were expendable, that's what we didn't like. Somebody you wouldn't know, but Anthony Eden was the Foreign Secretary of Britain at the time, and I was standing by a little called wireless radio set, and I remember him saying something about you, wherever you are, you brave soldiers can stay, we can get so many thousands out of Dunkirk. So we realised that we were expendable. We didn't like the sound of that. <laughs> Here, a silly little thing. Like, while we are in that citadel, uh, we could see the, the German guns were firing into the side because it was like a jelly, it was shaking, it was an old sand fort. And they were firing into the sort of side of it, the whole thing was shaking. But uh, then the dive bombers came down, the Messerschmitts, they were uh, it's called F-88, but they had holes on the wings and when they dived down it made a screaming noise which frightened the life out of us. It was just a noise, but they came down there and off they went. They were nasty plates, but in actual fact they weren't nearly as worrisome as the gunners because they were very accurate. However, it was the two of the artillery were firing into the side making the fort shake it. It was an old sand fort. And it wasn't built to be fired on. But anyway, that was. We got out of that in there, and I remember jumping over the wall. But I, was, I thought, if we were right in the harbour in Cali where this fort was, and I thought, somewhere there, there was a Dutch ship, and the reason I knew it was Dutch, the flag was on the stern, and it was half down. And I thought, if we could get down to that Dutch ship, there'd be a lifeboat. And in, somehow we get back to England. I was cut a long story short, there was a lifeboat. <clears throat> and one of the guys with me, senior to me, I, I, he couldn't swim. And I said, well, get your battle dress, that was heavy stuff we all. He didn't want to take his battle dress pants off. Well, there was nobody around. When I think back, it's so innocuous. I said, what the hell, get in the boat. And I had to try and lift him, he's a very heavy man. And I think back to this day, he was going to give me all sorts of metal. You know, so, but, oh, I, this is big luck. It, stupid things, I guess you remember. Anyway, we got this thing going and we were picked up by a hospital ship. Um, it's funny, my sister lives in Worthing, Sussex today. The hospital ship was called the Worthing. And it was a wonderful sight, just this big red cross on the side of the thing. And when you're in this lifeboat, wondering what's going to happen next. As we were shelled at one time by German gunners, who incidentally had a sense of humour, because they plus and minus. Do you have to understand gunners? You plus, minus, and then you've got the next one is right dead centre. They never fired the third. So I, all these years later, I think to myself, they could have blown us out of the water. They never did. There were only three of us in the lifeboat. That was hardly worthwhile. But on the other hand, Eight plus and minus. Anyway, we were picked up and it was a wonderful sight. I remember these nurses and when they opened the size of the ship and dragged us inside. For each sight to see those ladies. That's, yeah. Anyway, we got back to that was the funny thing. I had a, um, on that Dutch ship I had this Dutch great coat because I didn't have any clothes. And when we had been landed in Dover in England these ladies, uh, they were nurse, nurses, and they, I had this Dutch great coat which happened to be purple, same colour as the Germans, and they all backed away from me. They thought I was like a German. It's silly thing, I guess I remember. I said, no, I'm not a German. <laughs> but only, I think, 21 of us got it back. And I always said we were the fastest runners. <laughs> but, uh, no, about 3,000, but an awful lot of captured. Now, how many were actually killed, though, I wouldn't know. But only 21 of us got back to England. Funny thing in the service, the thing I always remember coming back out, you know, I spent six years in the service. Everybody was your friend. 
you come back out and everybody's competing. I mean, we all compete. Not in those six years. And that was the biggest surprise to me. I, to suddenly, I suppose in peacetime, six years doesn't sound that amount, but in wartime, yes, it's a hell of a long time. But you're all friends. It, and if you didn't, the nappy Navy Army, of course, it was anywhere you went, these ladies. But even in Burma, I found we were ashore in Rangoon, there was a nappy thing. These ladies were running it. If you didn't have a few pennies in your pocket, they'd give you a coffee and a bun, whatever it was. You always felt there was a sort of comradeship that never existed in peacetime. But I was out east. Um, I was sent back from Bombay, but I'd been in the in the Indian service. I got back a little later because the uh, war in, in Europe was over a good six months before the war in Japan, because that's where I, I'd been. And uh, when they dropped the horrible bomb, you see the Japs were still fighting. In fact, we were wondering how we'd ever get home because the Japs didn't mind dying, and we did. And we were prepared to, I mean, in all, in all honesty, I mean, I don't think we had the same degree of bravery that the Japs had. But uh, it did, all of a sudden we'd heard about this bomb, but we had no idea what it was. That was the, the horrible bomb. You know, our imagination, we, we were told about it, but we couldn't conjure in our mind what on earth it was. And then, uh, in the wardroom in the officer's area. We had this huge explosion. It still didn't mean anything. But if they hadn't had that bomb, we'd probably still be fighting at them. Because the, the Japs wouldn't surrender. A different philosophy to us. I didn't, funny, on the ship, everybody talked ladies, of course. And I was the only one that didn't have a lady. Well, I'd been away three years, and in peace times, three years, it's nothing. But I'd been east, and when I was, we were sailing back from Bombay, and I said, well, I knew my brother had a girlfriend in Brighton, England, the one that was killed. So when I got back, I phoned Brighton, and this young voice happened to be that lady in America, but they didn't know anybody. You know, when you've been away and <clears throat> been on ships, sure, you talk about ladies, but. I didn't have any contact, but only through my brother. I remember feeling rather stupid that I was the only one that never lay. <laughs> I see my, funny, my mother's house was bombed. Um, funny, my, somebody sent me a cutting. The, the house is on the market for sale for about a million pounds or something, but it was fire bombed. That's another thing, I didn't have any clothes. <clears throat> I think all the clothes you people have today. I had a, I had one pair of slacks probably, and the reason I'm in my uniform and I'm married, I didn't have any clothes. I, I just had one I'm standing up in there. Yeah, when I think of all the stuff my, my kids have got, I had one pair of pants at my mother's house when I've been smoked. So that's why I'm in that rig. So no money, I came over here, no money, a wife, no job. What prompted you to come to Canada? That's a good question. I, I, <clears throat> I've been to the Stock Exchange in England and my uncle bought me a partnership and he was a lawyer, no children. And I talked to this guy on the international phone every day Something called Lincoln with Thompson. Anyway, he kept joking, saying, Why didn't you get out of there, son? You know, things were terrible over there. We had ration books for a loaf of bread, um, a suit of clothes, you needed a ration book. And, uh, and this guy kept cajoling me to come over. Things were so good. Well, this country hadn't been touched, of course. And uh, it had all the riches under the ground. It seemed logical. Um, anyway, uh, without really thinking an awful lot, because my wife didn't want to come, 
I said I'm off and I came on my own to start with to see what it was really like. But um, I think at the end, I mean, poor old thing, she was very happy. But it was too. It's all right for a man. I mean, like looking back, a man goes out, and in those days, which 40, 50 years ago, the ladies weren't working as diligently as they do today. So she was like most, left at home, feeling gloomy, and I'm I'm out. Like I can see afterwards, it, it wasn't easy for her. But uh, then was then, now is now. Anyway, a long, long time ago.